Hello grade 10s and welcome to this lesson on measures of dispersion. To get a better understanding of how the data are distributed around the measure of central tendency, we need to use measures of spread. We call these measures of dispersion. The measures of dispersion will tell us if the data are grouped together or if they are spread out. Today our friends Gerard and Segra are planning to make burgers to sell at a school concert. They need to decide which burger patties to buy. Let's see how measures of dispersion will help them prepare for the big event. Hey Gerard, what's up? Hey. <clears throat> So, how are you doing? Well, the bands have confirmed, the traffic department has agreed that they can close off one of the street signs and make it a drop-off point, and now that Cindy's reduced the ticket prices, they're selling like hotcakes. And we've got some parents that have volunteered to help us with the making of the hamburgers and the toasted sandwiches. Gerald, stop that. If you carry on like that, you're going to end up eating our profit, man. Chill. I'm just doing some quality research. You see, I haven't decided which patty I want to buy it. Well, I've heard that jam yams are good. Yeah, I tasted those. And I tasted the two goods. But I need to take the one which has the best value for money. Well, how much do they cost? Well, they both cost the same price. And they both have the same amount of patties in the box. Okay, so why are you stressing yourself? Just toss a coin or something. It seems as if the two good patties are a bit bigger. Well, have you checked if the patties are heavier as well? Well, on the box it only has the total mass. And they're both the same. Well, maybe you got lucky or something and found an oversized patty. That's what I thought. So I weighed each patty individually. And I just confused myself more. We've just seen how Gerard decided to weigh each patty in two boxes of patties. That means he weighed 24 patties. You might think he's gone a little too far with his data collection. But let's see what he hopes to get from this. But then Gerard, if the total mass on both boxes is the same, then why did you bother weighing them individually? Well, I thought I could use what I learned about averages to help me somehow. See, I took the weights of the patties and I put them all in this table. And as you can see, I put them from lowest to highest. I can see that some of the tricky patties are like way lighter than some of the yum yums, and the rest are like way heavier. Hi guys! What you've noticed is that the masses of the two goods are more spread out. This means they have a larger range. What do you mean by range? The range is a simple measure of spread which shows how much the values of the data vary. And we calculate the range by subtracting the lowest value of data from the highest value of data. For example, the range of the masses of the two good patties is 401 minus 251, which gives us 150 grams. Gee, so the two good burger that I have might be a whole lot smaller than the two good burger that he has. Or a whole lot bigger. Now, Gerard, what's the range of the yum yum patties? The range of the yum yum patties is 353 minus 293. That's 60 grams. That sounds a bit better. It's possible that not all the two good boxes have such a wide range of patties. So let's look at another data handling tool that can help us here. It'll help us compare the spread of the masses of these patties without the results being affected by the very big or very small masses. Let me show you what I mean. First, we want to divide the data into two parts by finding the median. Do you remember how to do that? Sure. The median is the middle value when all the values are placed in order. Because I have 12 values in each set, the median lies between the 6th and 7th value. So the median of the two goods lies between 300 grams and 300 grams. So it must be 300 grams. And the median of the yum yums lies between 298 grams and 302 grams. So that's 300 grams. So the medians are the same. That means I still don't know which pet is bigger. Now what? Well, let's consider the two goods first. We're going to divide each half of the data into two parts again. 
What's the median of the first half? The median will be between the third and fourth values. So that's halfway between 286 and 292, which is 289. And the median for the numbers from 300 to 401 will be between 324 and 356. And I can work it out like this. 324 plus 356 is 680. Now, 680 divided by 2 is 340. So the median is 340. Good. Now, by finding these values for the two good patties, we have divided our data into four parts or four quarters. If we put these values onto a number line, we could show the divisions on the line like this. The numbers where we've made the divisions are called the quartiles, and there are three of them. The first quartile, or lower quartile, is 289 grams. The second quartile is the median. Here it is at 300 grams. The third quartile is three quarters of the way through the set, and that's called the upper quartile. Here it is at 340 grams. But what do these quartiles tell us about how spread out the data is? The quartiles help us to find the interquartile range. The inter what? The interquartile range. The range of numbers between the lower quartile and the upper quartile is called the interquartile range. To find this range, we just find the difference between them. So the interquartile range of the two good patties will be 340 minus 289, which is 51 grams. I still don't see how this can help us. I mean, what do we do with this information? If I complete this graph, I think it will be clearer. I can join the marks I made at the upper and the lower quartiles with a box like this. I can also add a line onto each side of the box that ends at the minimum point of the range and the maximum point of the range. Now I've created what we call a box and whisker plot of the data. Eloise has used five important numbers to plot this box and whisker plot. We call this the five number summary. The five number summary includes the minimum value, the first quartile value, the second quartile value, which is also known as the median, the third quartile value, and the maximum value. Let's go back to Gerard, Segra, and Eloise as they work with this more. The part of the graph that's within the box indicates the interquartile range. In certain situations, this range can be more useful than the bigger range we found that goes from the minimum to the maximum value. With the two good patties, you were worried you had picked a box with an unusually small patty and an unusually large patty in it. To avoid the possibility of this happening, we can look at the interquartile range only and compare that with the interquartile range of the yum-yums and make a more reliable decision about the sizes of the patties. I think I see where you're going with this. Let's work out the interquartile range of the yum-yum patties and see where that gets us. Sure, can I try that? Sure. We've already worked out the median for the yum yum masses, which was between the 9th and the 10th value. This gives us the median mass of 300 grams. Then I take the numbers on this side of the median and find their halfway mark. That's between the 3rd and the 4th numbers in the set, and that's 296 grams. Well done, Sigra. You found the lower quartile, which as you say, is 296 grams. Now what about the upper quartile? To find the upper quartile, I'll have to use the numbers on the other side of the median. And the third and the fourth numbers here are 306 and 312. So the number lies between 306 and 312, which will be 309. Does this mean the interquartile range for yum yums is 309 minus 296, which is 13 grams? 
absolutely right, Sigra. Now let's see what the interquartile range has shown us about the data. The interquartile range of the two goods is 51 grams and the interquartile range of yum yums is 13 grams. As you can see, there's a big difference. This tells us that the two goods are more spread out right across the data, not just at the ends. In other words, the smaller interquartile range of the yum yums shows us that the sizes of the patties are far closer to each other. There's only a difference of 13 grams. Sometimes researchers take this interquartile range and divide it in half again to find the semi-interquartile range. This gives you an even smaller range within the middle part of your data. So the semi-interquartile range for the two goods will be half of 51. That's 25,5 grams. And the semi-interquartile range for the yum yums will be half of 13 grams. That's 6,5 grams. So, it's not about the two goods being slightly bigger or slightly smaller than the yum yums. It's rather about the large spread of weight. Some might be really big and some might be really small. So, if I serve two friends hamburgers and one gets a really small patty while the other one gets a really big one, I'm going to be in some serious trouble. I think the smaller range of the yum yums mean that the patties are closer to each other in size. And I think that's why it's a better buy. Very wise, Gerard. So let's have a quick look at what we've covered in this lesson. First, we looked at the range of your data by subtracting the minimum value from the maximum value. Then we divided the data set into four parts and found the lower and upper quartiles. After that, we found the interquartile range by subtracting the lower quartile from the upper quartile. And lastly, we translated the interquartile range into a smaller number by halving it. We called this the semi-interquartile range. Working with interquartile and semi-interquartile ranges wasn't actually as hard as I thought it would be. So now all that's left for me to do is to go out there and buy my yum yum patties. That way I'll be ready for the concert. The data was extremely useful in helping to choose the best burger patties. Now we're going to look at one more way to divide data. Percentiles. Percentile comes from the word percent and divides a group of data into a hundred parts, similar to percentages. Let's do an example. Work out the 60th percentile of these marks. We first need to make sure the data is ordered. So we rewrite the marks from smallest to biggest. The marks start with 60 and end on the highest mark of 99. There are 20 marks in total. Now that we have ordered the numbers, we can work out the position of the 60th percentile. Once we have the position of the mark, we can see what the value of the mark will be. The position of the 60th percentile is 60% times the number of values, which is 20. This gives us 12. Therefore, the 60th percentile lies in position 12 in our list of 20 marks. The mark in position 12 is 82. Therefore, the 60th percentile is 82. This tells us that 60% of the marks are less than or equal to 82 and 40% of the marks are above 82. For more practice in this section, look at our tasks found in the Discovering Statistics task video. You'll also be able to learn more about statistics on our website www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. If you understand how data is dispersed, hopefully your attention won't be. Goodbye, grade 10s.